Hello, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, What You Need to Know About COVID-19 and MS, Program 5. I am Peter Demiri, Vice President of Programs and Services for MSAA, and your host for tonight's program. On behalf of MSAA and our presenters, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to keep you updated on this very important topic, and please know that we hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy in these uncertain times. MSAA is extremely honored to welcome back our two MS expert advisors who will update us about the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on MS and answer your questions during our expanded Q&A session. At this time, I would like to introduce our special guest presenters, Dr. Barry Hendon and Dr. Carrie Hirsch. Dr. Barry Hendon is MSAA's Chief Medical Officer and a practicing neurologist at Phoenix Neurological Associates. He is also the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Clinic at Banner University Medical Center and clinical professor of neurology at the University of Arizona Medical School. Dr. Carrie Hirsch is the chair of MSAA's Healthcare Advisory Council. She is a practicing neurologist and assistant professor of neurology for the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ravo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you both again for being here tonight and keeping us updated on this very important issue. Peter, I'm sure I speak for Dr. Hirsch in saying that uh, we're both uh, delighted to be working together again and also to join you and, and the people uh, across the country who have expressed an interest in learning more about COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Hannon. appreciate that. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank our supporters, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono, Genentech, Novartis, and Santa Fe Genzyme, for making this webinar series possible. As you may know, MSAA is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving lives today for the MS community. In fact, today marks MSAA's 50th anniversary as an MS advocacy organization. Listed here are just some of our many free programs available to people living with MS all across the country, along with our updated information on COVID-19. Also, please know MSAA has expanded our helpline hours to 8 p.m. Eastern between Mondays and Fridays. To learn more about our services, please visit mymsaa.org or call 1-800-532-7667. And lastly, tonight's program will be archived to our website very soon. Since we covered extensive information about the coronavirus in earlier webinars, we have shortened tonight's overview to allow more time for Q&A, which includes questions that were submitted in advance on the registration form, as, long as, as well as questions you typed into the chat box during tonight's program. Also, if you are experiencing any technical issues, please type those questions into the chat box as well. So with all of that now covered, I am honored to once again introduce Dr. Barry Hendon, who will start off tonight's program. So the, the first slide really is just an overview of, of coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, to set a context for those of, of you out there who have uh, not uh, participated in any of the prior programs, uh, the first bullet point says that uh, uh, COVID-19 is a potentially serious inflammatory disease that targets the respiratory uh, system, and it's part of a large family of coronaviruses, uh, many of which have produced uh, uh, very mild symptoms, uh, including a common cold. When, when we say that it targets uh, the respiratory system, don't believe that that is um, isolated to the uh, respiratory sy uh, system. So the presenting uh, symptoms may be uh, fever or a cough, uh, uh, much like another upper respiratory illness, uh, pneumonia later, a lower respiratory illness. But the presenting symptoms can be very various, uh, including uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, uh, loss of or uh, alteration sense of smell and taste, muscle aching. Uh, so it's it's not one one presentation fits all. Uh, can be very very uh, uh, diverse. The second the bullet point says that having MS in and of itself does not put you at greater risk uh, for COVID-19. 
the risk factors really are more about age and comorbidities. And so uh, if you have MS and are severely debilitated with difficulty breathing or, or clearing the um, um, mucus, et cetera, of course, there's some increased risk just, uh, just because of that, as there would be with any respiratory illness. But otherwise, MS does not appear to be the driving factor in, in outcomes. It is more uh, age, uh, particularly over 65 or 75, uh, comorbidities uh, like uncontrolled hypertension or asthma uh, or diabetes or cancer uh, or kidney disease or cardiorespiratory disease, um, and also habits uh, like smoking. Um, so um, the good news is that MS does not in and of itself create greater risk, uh, but that doesn't make you immune from the risk of comorbidities. And the next bullet point is that um, although there are lots of opinions about of the disease-modifying therapies, um, the, the field has evolved from, from early recommendations about which uh, agents uh, were thought to be uh, less uh, a risk and more at risk. I think the evolution has been to uh, see that uh, the agents uh, that we're using do not appear yet to have a distinct risk profile that would make one of them uh, uh, unusable um, uh, as opposed to the others. Uh, the nice thing in, and Dr. Hirsch will speak of this too, I know, there have been registries, um, one of which is uh, COVMS, that's an American registry. There's an Italian registry. There's an English registry. It looks like uh, people with MS on a wide variety of disease-modifying therapies are doing about the same as the general population. It doesn't mean we know the final answers. This has been around for about six months, uh, and we're still understanding in trying to understand what puts one person at risk, uh, how we can reduce risk in another. At this particular moment, the last bullet point says, don't stop your disease-modifying therapy. Don't change it uh, without talking to your clinician. Stopping some of the disease-modifying therapies can lead to what we call a rebound or an increase in risk. Uh, therefore, um, uh, any change uh, would be one that you would make in conjunction with your clinician. We do not recommend based on current evidence that one or another of the medications be stopped or changed other than the way you would do it otherwise. Uh, that is to say, a medication you're not tolerating or that isn't controlling the MS. With that overview, uh, let me go to um, the questions uh, that were asked that uh, Peter uh, put together for us before we open it to live questions uh, from people uh, uh, on the telephone. So the first question, I kind of answered. Are we more susceptible to hitting COVID-19 if we're taking disease-modifying therapy? And do different therapies place us at greater risk uh, for getting or recovering from the virus? The answer is, based on current evidence, no. Um, and then if you said, do we think that we know uh, enough yet, uh, having experienced COVID-19 for six months, the answer is we're still looking at this. But the encouraging uh, sign, the encouraging early indicators are uh, that the people with MS uh, do as well as the general population, generally, uh, with the same comorbidities and age, et cetera, and that there is no specific agent which has been shown to have uh, uh, more particularly bad outcomes, though that was an issue uh, which we debated early on. Um, uh, Dr. Hirsch. Thank you so much, Dr. Hendon. And I would also like to echo that um, I'm thrilled to be back for our fifth iteration of this um, uh, webinar that I hope our viewers have found helpful, and uh, especially in a rapidly evolving situation, hopefully they have been learning alongside with us. This is certainly a very different time, and um, we have all been learning together. So. Hopefully, we'll be able to continue uh, providing um, um, education and services to the community that folks find helpful. So to continue, uh, the next question, um, can having primary progressive MS create a greater risk of severe illness if I get the COVID-19 virus? And I think that this is a very interesting question. Um, you know, at this point in time, uh, we're, we're, we're not aware that 
um, having a particular phase of MS puts one at an increased risk of developing a viral infection, but more so, as Dr. Hennon was alluding to, um, age and other comorbidities, um, such as uh, poorly controlled diabetes and obesity, chronic heart and lung disease, uh, cancer, and other lifestyle choices, such as chronic tobacco smoking, it certainly looks like these are the risk factors that certainly place patients at an increased risk of developing uh, the COVID-19 virus and having a worse off time with it. Folks who have um, primary progressive MS tend to be older, and they may have more disability compared to younger patients with relapsing remitting MS. And those who are older and have more um, irreversible disability may be at more risk of having trouble clearing secretions because they're not able to mobilize as well as other people who have a different phase of the condition or who are younger. So those are the factors that I would place at um, increasing the overall risk of developing COVID-19 and maybe having a worse off time of it, but not necessarily a primary progressive MS disease course. Dr. Hendon. Sure. Next question is, is it safe for me to access medical care, um, and, and how do I stay safe uh, if I or a family member returns to work? Let me take the first part. Um, I, I think it's been, uh, first of all, yes, uh, when it's necessary to access medical care, be that doctor visits or MRI, blood work infusions, we believe that uh, those medical, um, th those Fundamentals of medical care really ought to be um, uh, undertaken. But, but that's where we're really seeing a change in the delivery of medicine. So um, uh, uh, eight months ago, virtually every doctor visit was, uh, every clinician visit or doctor visit was a face-to-face. -face. I think uh, we have recognized uh, both as a, as a field of medicine and in, as a, in particular with MS, um, that uh, we need to do more to safeguard our patients. And so um, that's why uh, most uh, visits uh, across the U.S., um, uh, including most visits in my own practice, are done uh, by telemedicine, a way of keeping people safer. And what do we mean by that? They don't need to come into a medical setting. They don't need to come into a hospital. They don't need to come into a clinic unless necessary. So um, there are uh, a limited number of people who really do need to be seen face-to-face. -face. We arrange for that to be done. Uh, but many uh, people can have their visits by telemedicine. The next thing is, um, how does one get to uh, see the, the clinician, the physician, the nurse practitioner, the PA? Um, uh, public transportation can be difficult. Uh, all the more reasons to try to find safer forms of, of transportation. It, it also makes me ask the question about a particular uh, MRI or about particular blood work, and that is, uh, was this one really necessary or was it being done as a matter of, of just uh, rigid routine? So it, it does make me have to ask questions each time about how do I maintain uh, greater safety for the people in my practice? And that means both the, the people with MS, but also staff. Uh, and then the same thing about uh, family or returning to work. And, and there it comes down the basics. And so uh, you'll see forever discussions about uh, uh, very uh, uh, esoteric uh, things about lymphocyte counts or one, whether one medication is more immunosuppressive or less immunosuppressive. The fundamentals are unchanged, and that is the social distancing, wearing a mask, hand washing, not touching your face. I know it sounds as if that is too fundamental, too common sense, so fundamental is to be ignored. Don't ignore it. Uh, if you go out, uh, if your family member goes out, remember the common uh, precautions. Uh, hand washing, uh, wearing a, a, a mask, social distancing, not touching your face, et cetera. Uh, I'll repeat it as many times as I need to, but those are fundamental. Uh, Dr. Hirsch. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question is, I'm concerned my lymphocytes are low. Can this increase my risk for contracting COVID-19? And I also think that this is a very important question that has certainly been 
um, at the forefront of topics, not only among um, the folks who are living with MS and their caregivers, but also um, MS providers alike. And in trying to determine whether or not there is a linear correlation or a direct correlation uh, between people who are on um, medicines that um, lead to low lymphocyte counts or white blood cell counts, and whether or not that increases the risk of developing a respiratory infection. And, um, you know, generally speaking, we have not been able to showcase that any specific disease-modifying therapy as a whole is causally related to an increased risk of developing COVID-19 and having a worse off time of it. Now, that's not to say that monitoring lymphocyte counts are not important because it certainly is. And there are certain disease-modifying therapies where lower lymphocyte counts than what is expected to be in the normal range is actually the mechanism of action of how the disease-modifying therapy works and is expected. But in other disease-modifying therapies, having lower white blood cell counts or low lymphocyte counts are deemed more to be an adverse effect as opposed to a mechanism of how the medicine works and safeguarding against more MS disease activity. So it really does depend on a disease-modifying therapy and what we consider to be ex acceptably low versus not acceptably low. And again, this is encouraging um, our patients and their caregivers to make sure that Folks are being observed on their particular disease-modifying therapies and having open communications with their MS healthcare provider on any concerns there are. What I also seem to think is that folks who have other healthcare risk factors, those who have uncontrolled vascular comorbidities, and we have listed several of those, those who are chronic smokers, those who are older, those who are more disabled, they may have an increased risk if their lymphocyte counts are on the lower side compared to other individuals who are otherwise very healthy individuals who have lower lymphocyte counts. So it's really taking the entire individual as a whole and individually deciding whether or not um, that particular disease-modifying therapy needs to be monitored more closely. And again, we emphasize the importance of not discontinuing a disease-modifying therapy without first speaking with the MS healthcare provider and in a shared decision-making format, developing a plan that everyone feels comfortable in uh, following with. And Dr. Hennon. Sure. Um, this one, I think I may be able to, to speak simply. It says, how can you tell the difference between MS issues and COVID-19 issues? And, uh, on, the, on the surface, uh, they're very different diseases. And so COVID-19 is a, an acute or subacute, uh, often febrile or feverish uh, problem with coughing or change in sense of smell, change in sense of taste, aching muscles, et cetera. I feel uh, um, sometimes a, like a simple flu. Uh, some people don't have any symptoms whatsoever. But when the symptoms do occur, they're the symptoms of a febrile uh, illness. Um, that's quite different from uh, MS. Um, uh, and, and those of you on the, on the phone line uh, know that uh, uh, MS does not present generally with those same set of symptoms, and that is to say, fever, cough, et cetera. I suppose where the, where the lines become blurry is if a person has COVID-19 and the fever, couldn't their MS act up and make it uh, in terms of a pseudo relapse? And that is the worst thing that people feel with any kind of fever. Um, the worst thing that people with MS have uh, with any kind of general illness. So if one gets uh, COVID-19, I expect uh, them to feel um, a bit worse, both with respect to their COVID-19 and potentially with their MS due to fever. But the presentations are very, very different. Uh, Dr. Hirsch. Okay, the next question. Will it be safe for people with MS to take a COVID-19 treatment or vaccine once these are developed? 
And, um, you know, again, all of these questions are, are, are very important, and some of them we have great insights and answers to, and others it's really more on a wait-and-see approach. And I think that uh, this question is, uh, is really following the latter. Um, right now, we currently do not have a vaccine, which everyone on this call, I'm sure, is aware of. And COVID-19 treatments are still being um, tested out. Um, there have been some uh, treatments that do look promising, such as remdesivir and uh, convalescent plasma, which is essentially taking the plasma of someone who has uh, been affected and recovered from COVID-19, developed an antibody response, and essentially donating those antibodies to another individual who is sick. And those treatments are actually looking promising. Um, in terms of vaccines, obviously we don't have a vaccine yet, but there are um, currently many different clinical trials that are currently ongoing to test the safety and effectiveness of these potential vaccines. Currently, in terms of vaccines at large, we do feel that inactivated or dead vaccines uh, tend to be safe in people who are living with MS, such as the seasonal flu vaccine. But other vaccines, such as live attenuated vaccines, may be um, um, a, a little bit questionable depending upon the disease-modifying therapy that the person is taking. And the safety of having a live attenuated vaccine really needs to be weighed in terms of risks and benefits with the MS healthcare provider. So it really remains to be seen whether or not the vaccine that uh, will ultimately be approved by the FDA and used commercially will be a live attenuated or an inactivated or dead vaccine. And if it is the latter, then I think for the most part, it should probably be safe in people who are living with MS. The big question, however, is someone's response to the vaccine, whether or not they'll be able to mount an appropriate um, immune response to a vaccine to safeguard the individual from developing the COVID-19 infection later. And right now, we don't have a clear idea of whether or not the vaccine is going to be a one-time vaccine or if it's going to need to be given in multiple series or is it going to be a seasonal vaccine very similar to the influenza or flu vaccine. And that we really don't know. But what we do know is that there are certain disease-modifying therapies that do deplete part of the immune system that may impact one's ability to mount an appropriate response to a vaccine. And so what we expect is when a vaccine is finally approved, that there will be um, real-world studies looking at the safety and effectiveness of uh, providing a COVID-19 vaccine to individuals on certain disease-modifying therapies to see if there is a blended response. So again, it is going to be a watch and wait. Um, you know, currently things are rapidly evolving, um, but of course we'll continue to keep the MS community um, informed and educated as we learn more information along the way. Dr. Hendon. Sure. Uh, so. Peter and, and Dr. Hirsch both know that I, I tend to quote Bob Dylan a bit, uh, and the line that I use is a line from the, the times they are changing. Uh, uh, Dr. Hirsch used the term watch and wait. Uh, I take the line from the times they are changing, which is don't speak too soon, for the wheel is still in spin, uh, meaning uh, it's still too early to give final answers to some of the questions being asked, but what we're trying to do Dr. Hirsch and I, is to give the best answers we can at this moment, knowing that uh, the next time we're on the line with each other, uh, the next time we speak to uh, our patients, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the information may be greater, and therefore our, our answers may be more sophisticated um, and, and more certain. But to the next question, how many times can a person be infected with COVID-19? So this is similar to the question that Dr. Hirsch answered, and that's about immunity. We know that uh, for the coronaviruses in general, uh, there is um, a, uh, an immunologic response uh, which protects that person for a period of time thereafter. 
we know that um, that immunity, and that is the immunity you get when you get an infection, may be partial um, or total, uh, but it's not. Uh, but it may be. It may not be complete uh, protection. And then number two, it generally doesn't last forever. So to the question, how many times can a person be reinfected? I would answer it very similarly to the way that Dr. Hirsch answered the previous question. Um, based on current evidence, uh, it looks like having gotten COVID-19 gives you some degree of immunity, uh, maybe not complete, but some degree of immunity, so that for a period of time, uh, you uh, have protection or partial protection against reinfection. Um, um, how long that will last is uncertain. Uh, will it be a year? Will it be two uh, or more or less? Uh, that's what is still an unknown. Um, but we may find ourselves in that case, uh, going back to the, the need to uh, deal with the COVID-19 or a, uh, a, a, a mutation of our current COVID-19 because it is a rapidly changing virus um, with, uh, with seasonal protection. And that is to say, um, having it um, and getting over it is good uh, and gives you partial protection for a while, probably not permanently, probably not completely. Uh, we'll visit it again uh, once we know more. Dr. Hirsch. Okay, the next question, if I contract COVID-19, will this have a long-lasting impact on my MS? And um, I, I, I would like to start by um, um, not quite answering this particular question, but providing some reassurance in terms of what we are now understanding about uh, folks who are living with MS to develop COVID-19, what their overall response is. And um, I, I, I'm actually taking this from the COVID-MS data, uh, which stands for COVID-19 infections and MS and related diseases. And uh, this is a cooperative effort between the National MS Society, the CMSC, the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. And this is a North American registry that our currently um, corroborating data from all across different MS centers and general neurologists alike on the prevalence of COVID-19 among individuals who are living with uh, multiple sclerosis. And I am happy to report that out of 260 individuals with confirmed MS who were reported as having contracted COVID-19, over 90% of those individuals have either recovered or are currently recovering, and there's only a 5% uh, uh, rate of death among this particular cohort of individuals who have been reported. So the vast majority of individuals with MS are doing fine after developing the infection, and it doesn't look right off the bat that there is an increased mortality rate compared to the general population. And those individuals who tend to be more at risk, again, are those who are older and those who have other comorbidities that we had already talked about, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, morbid obesity, or who are smokers. So this really aligns with the information that we were speculating towards the beginning of the outbreak based on the registry data that we currently have available to share with you all. Now going back to this question, if I contract COVID-19, will this have a long lasting impact on, on my MS? And I would say that overall, this is likely not the case. Um, that the COVID-19 infection tends to be um, an infection, a respiratory infection that lasts for a certain period of time. And most people have either recovered or are still recovering based on what we have in the COVID-MS uh, registry. In terms of a long-lasting impact on my MS, so Dr. Hendon had alluded to the fact that individuals who 
um, develop infections or fever, sometimes they can experience what we call a pseudo relapse, which means worsening of previous MS symptoms simply based on the fact that the core body temperature is raised and this seems to make the MS symptoms feel worse, but it's not actually causing any new inflammatory demyelination in the brain and the spinal cord. And so this is very similar to what can happen with COVID-19, that someone may have a pseudo relapse, but we currently are not seeing that COVID-19 in and of itself is having a separate impact on the long-term course of MS. So I would say overall, no, I do not believe that contracting COVID-19 will have a long lasting impact on one's MS, which is very reassuring to say. Dr. Hendon. Sure, the next question is I think a, a real life question. Uh, it, it's difficult for me to get to the grocery store. What are your thoughts about MS patients eating frozen and microwavable meals? And, and so I think um, we're all in a new universe um, and, and I would contend we're doing the best we can. Uh, that may mean that we are uh, changing habits, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should lose track of, of wellness. And uh, Dr. Hirsch, uh, in a moment, will take over and talk about wellness as it relates to social and psychological wellness and physical wellness, um, and, and this relates to some of that. So. I would say um, there are still some basic rules, um, and that is trying to maintain uh, a proper body weight. Uh, it, it may be difficult in these times to uh, get out and do the regular exercises that you were, but you should. Uh, it may be difficult to get fresh vegetables, but frozen vegetables um, um, have their own degree of nutrition and safety. Uh, my own, my own um, view is, do the best you can. Uh, don't be overly hard on yourself. Practice the, the general principles of wellness, and to the extent that how you eat plays a role in that, uh, maintain your body weight. Uh, try not to, um, uh, to lose track of that and, uh, and gain, uh, because gaining weight is bad for MS and bad for MS uh, during COVID-19. Uh, number two, uh, eat um, pro proportionately. Maintain fruits and vegetables and lean meat. Uh, uh, and if uh, it is a little more difficult to, uh, to get them, uh, modify, but modify sensibly as part of general wellness. And so with that as a kind of a lead-in, Dr. Hirsch, would you talk about, uh, uh, I think, the next slide, uh, which is really about physical and emotional well-being and wellness? Yes, absolutely. And that was actually a fantastic transition into this very important topic. Um, so the MSAA has, has been um, a very strong supporter of health and wellness in MS as a very important complementary strategy to the long-term management of MS. And we feel that the health and wellness components are increasingly even more important nowadays um, in the midst of a uh, viral pandemic. So most of what we have actually been encouraging um, our viewers is not different at all from what we have been encouraging um, our patients with MS for long-term MS management. So for those individuals who have already been um, strong supporters of, um, of remaining um, not only physically, but mentally active and healthy, um, you're already in, uh, in, a, in a great position um, in the middle of a viral pandemic. So some of these things include um, getting plenty of sleep, being physically active, um, drinking plenty of fluids, really remaining well hydrated, eating a nutritious and balanced diet, and of course, managing stress. And of course, you know, this is also in the wake of many other um, different challenging times that um, all around the world is currently being affected by, and this is not just the COVID-19 pandemic, but learning how to manage stress um, is, is a very important tool here. 
And there are, are certainly a number of ways that folks can manage stress. And it really depends on the individual and what works for them. Um, so in my experience, you know, picking up a hobby or picking up something that just brings you joy can be a really strong and robust stress uh, manager. Um, but other people find uh, other ways in order to reduce their stress levels. And that can be simply by taking a quiet walk and reflecting uh, uh, in, their, in their quiet thoughts, um, reading a book, um, going out and exercising, speaking to a loved one, and sometimes even speaking with a professional can be very helpful. Um, we, we certainly want to uh, go against stigmatizing mental health. Mental health is significantly important, and it's not just in the MS community. It, this, is, this is a global issue. And seeking out help when you feel that you need help should not be stigmatized. It should be recognized, and we really should be overjoyed by someone who is reaching out and asking for help. So all of these things can truly be um, instrumental um, in, in managing um, their overall health and wellness uh, during this time. So, you know, there has been obviously a lot of talk about CDC recommendations and mitigating one's risk of uh, contracting COVID-19, making sure that you are aware of potential exposures, and this whole concept of social distancing. And while that, yes, continues to be important, uh, we certainly shouldn't let that get in the way of doing things that give us joy, as long as folks are doing this in a safe environment. So taking a walk outside um, can, can certainly be a way not only to get some good physical activity in, but again, can be very important for mental health as well. It could certainly serve as an important way of, of self-reflection and, and thinking about goals and what you want to do um, for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week, and keeping your thoughts organized. I certainly find that taking a walk outside is, is very helpful, and this is something that I have actually um, integrated into my routine um, at home. Um, and it's really important to understand that social distancing does not equal social disengagement. So um, um, I, 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 I was... Um, um, uh, very interested to learn before the uh, the talk started that we have now celebrated our hundredth day of um, of our first reported case in the United States of COVID nineteen. So, you know, it's now been about three months of um, of, of all of the recommendations of. Um, of you know social uh, of social distancing and you know watching exposures and and hearing on the news the number of cases that are popping up everywhere, um, but you know we we also need to understand that it's really not just about COVID nineteen it's also about um, our physical health and our mental health and we certainly don't want to advocate for people to feel like they are isolated. Um, there are certainly other ways that folks can. Um, keep engaged with their loved ones, with their friends, with their family, um, including, um, you know, vir virtual uh, means, um, you know, there, there have been um, um, a, a, a huge um, influx of people who have been engaging in FaceTime and uh, Doximity chats and Zoom chats. And this is really a nice way to, you know, keep um, in touch with your loved ones because this is really important for um, remaining um, connected with your loved ones. And, and that certainly takes um, a toll when you are feeling isolated. So we need to make sure that we are maintaining that connection among our loved ones. Um, and, and as I have been alluding to this entire time, mental health is extremely important. And um, there's certainly um, uh, numerous ways that people can find um, relaxation and self-reflection. Um, and some of these um, are offered um, um, as free applications. Um, there are certainly ways that 
uh, uh, folks can remain engaged with each other through guided imagery, deep breathing, and mindfulness. Um, certainly um, seeking out counseling services when some of these um, opportunities um, uh, are not very helpful, uh, we would certainly encourage. But, you know, please don't be shy to seek out, you know, some of these opportunities that are available if you are feeling um, stressed and overwhelmed during these challenging times because you are not alone. Um, th this is certainly a time of uncertainty. And of course, all of us at the MSAA are here to support our, our patients, our caregivers, and of course, all of our viewers. Peter, I, so I think that, you may have No, go ahead, Dr. Hirsch. Oh, so I was just going to say, with that being said, I was going to open it up for questions, but of course, Dr. Hendon. I, oh, I, so I think Peter may be asking uh, us some questions, uh, Dr. Hirsch, but there's one that I saw on the, uh, on the uh, feedback or the uh, questions and answers from people uh, um, uh, on the other side of the, of the audio. And one of them asked a question which is dear to my heart. And that is, how old is older when we speak of risks? And I, it's, it's dear to my heart because I am chronologically one of the people uh, at risk, and that is uh, over age 60 or 65. So let me kind of address that, and then Peter, if you'll uh, take on the other questions that you think uh, uh, for Dr. Hirsch and for me. Um, we know that there, that there is no age at which um, you are uh, invulnerable, free of risk uh, with COVID-19. So uh, if you've been watching the TV, and I think many of us have been watching it too much, uh, you know that there is an infant and a childhood syndrome of COVID-19, which can also be serious and lethal. Uh, but in terms of mortality, generally the mortality has increased with age. And so um, if you look at some statistics, and I want you to use these numbers as, as approximate, um, over age 65, the risk may be as high as 5%. Over 75, it's doubled. Uh, over 85, it's tripled. And so age is in and of itself a risk factor. But then, uh, much like real life, um, people at age 65 or 75 or beyond um, don't come uh, in just one side. So the question is, um, what about uh, the, the physical condition of that individual? There may be a 75-year-old with no other comorbidities whose risk is relatively lower, and a 58-year-old with uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension or uncontrolled asthma or cardiovascular disease. Um, I would say that... Uh, uh, age is a risk, uh, partly because increased age carries increased uh, health risk, comorbidities. Um, um, it, so if I were to summarize, um, uh, COVID-19 affects all ages, uh, but the older patients more so, debilitated patients most so, and that's why so many of the deaths have been in nursing homes, because they combine uh, decreased function, increased disability, and increased age. Um, no one age is in and of itself uh, a, a total risk, but just another risk factor. Uh, Peter, I think you, there may be other questions uh, that you would uh, uh, present to uh, Dr. Hirsch or to me. Yes, thank you so much, and talk, thank you, Dr. Hirsch, as well. Uh, excellent presentation, great insights to those questions, and several more have come in during the presentation. Uh, there was a follow-up question on the topic of the lymphocytes, and the question was, does a person need near-normal levels of lymphocytes to have a good defense against COVID-19? Dr. Hirsch, do you want to lead in? Yeah, that's fine. Um, yes, I've been seeing, um, you know, some questions coming in, and, uh, you know, I certainly understand, um, um, you know, folks certainly want a more concrete answer. Um, I, I would overall say, you know, we have very different disease-modifying therapies with very different mechanisms of action. So sometimes it's very difficult to provide a blanket statement 
on the levels of lymphocytes that would be considered quote unquote safe uh, during a viral pandemic. Um, for instance, there are certain medications like fingolimod and saponamod, and now um, uh, we certainly have um, um, other S1P modulators that are, so fingolimod and saponamod are in this group of disease-modifying therapies, and now we have a new medication, ozanamod, that was just um, FDA approved, that by their mechanism, the way that they work is that they traffic circulating lymphocytes in the bloodstream into the secondary lymphoid organs, so that way they are not available as inflammatory lymphocytes to get into the brain and spinal cord and cause increased um, uh, demyelinating disease that can manifest as relapses and new MRI lesions. Now, because of the way that works, when someone gets a blood test, the amount of circulating lymphocytes in the bloodstream are going to be low. That is how the medication works. Now, we have seen historically that just because a person has a lower lymphocyte count than normal on these particular disease-modifying therapies, it does not correlate with a linear relationship of an increased risk of respiratory infections and urinary tract infections. So with that being said, yes, we do expect that those lymphocytes are going to be low in those particular individuals, but that may not necessarily increase that person's risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus or having a worse off time of it. And we are starting to see that in some of the registry data that are coming through. To answer a question because there are a lot of um, folks who are currently on ocrelizumab or rituximab, and probably some of those patients are currently on the call and they want to know more information about these particular disease modifying therapies that have a propensity of decreasing what we call the B cells. So, in a normal immune system, we have our innate immune system and our adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is the part of the immune system that learns along the person's lifetime of when they are exposed to a certain virus, which is otherwise known as an antigen, the adaptive immune system is able to adapt a response to that particular virus so that if the person is infected later on, that person's immune system can then go ahead and create a faster immune response to that infection so they can clear a lot faster than when they were first exposed to it. The way that ocrelizumab and rituximab work, which are our B cell depleting disease modifying therapies, is that they deplete part of that adaptive immune system, particularly the B cells. But what happens is that they typically leave the most immature B cells alone, which are more of the stem cells, and they tend to spare the plasma cells, which are the ones that are creating antibodies, such as IgG, IgM, and IgA. And these B cell depleting therapies are targeting the B cells that are in the maturing phase, but not in the most mature phase. So with that being said, there are still circulating B cells in one's immune system, in someone's vascular system, and by and large, the other lymphocytes, such as your T cells, specifically your cytotoxic T cells, are spared and patients who are treated with ocrelizumab and rituximab. And we can learn by this by doing a lymphocyte panel. And we can see in one lymphocyte panel whether or not they are depleting other aspects of that adaptive immune system. And this gives us an idea of whether or not that particular individual may be at risk of developing any kind of respiratory or viral infections such as COVID-19. So in my patients who are being treated with these B cell depleting agents, if I'm not seeing that there is a growth change in these other subsets of lymphocytes, 
we are continuing the ocrelizumab and we are carefully monitoring their overall white blood cell counts and carefully monitoring them for any signs of infection. In my practice, I also recommend that around the time that they are undergoing their infusion, that they may be a little bit more careful about potential exposures. So if they're unable to socially distance themselves from other individuals who live outside the home or other individuals who are at work, that this is a good time to make sure that they are wearing a mask or a facial covering and certainly engaging in frequent hand washing. So I, I hope that this gives a little bit more context into disease-modifying therapies and the safety during COVID-19 and that it's not um, a one-size-fits-all response, that it really depends on the uh, disease-modifying therapy. Dr. Hirsch, if, if I, I, you don't mind my piggybacking onto what you said, because as usual, I agree entirely with, with the information you provided, but I'll, I'll select out a couple of things that you've said in order to see if I can um, kind of contribute to uh, uh, understanding. The first thing that, that people on the other side of this conversation will begin to understand is how complex the immune system is. And and, um, and, um, and and let me begin by saying, if you've got MS, uh, all the conversation about MS that you've been exposed to has been about the adaptive immune system, and that is T cells and B cells. Um, it's very infrequent that you'll hear that that's only part of the immune protection you've got, and that there is another Im immune protection, which is uh, the innate immune system, which is the first offense. And so if you say, what's the first offense against a, a virus? It's not the T cells and B cells at all. Uh, it, it's, it's the innate immune system, and the innate immune system is by and large not affected by the medications that we use to treat MS. Uh, so even when we're dealing with immunosuppression, uh, the innate immune system, the first offense, remains uh, generally uh, fairly much uh, un unimpeded. The second thing is uh, that, that components of the immune system that we count on uh, to attack viruses, um, for example, uh, the cytotoxic B cells that uh, uh, Dr. Hirsch mentioned uh, um, aren't necessarily diminished in the same proportion as other immune cells. Uh, it makes it that much more uh, complex. So what have we tried to do? We've tried to go back to real life experience. The, the very first uh, major epidemic in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe, the Western Hemisphere, was in, uh, uh, in uh, Italy. And the Italians, uh, uh, who were the first without a lot of information, with a lot of hypothetical concerns, said, if you're on a, uh, that you ought to be very careful about using the lymphocyte depleting agents um, and and we, we recognize the Italian concern in that regard. What's happened over the past six months is that we've been able to see both uh, the American experience, which was the COBMS that Dr. Hirsch talked about, uh, the Italian experience now looked at more clearly uh, by Dr. Pia Sarmani uh, with the first 250 and now about 500 patients, and that is that people on the wide variety of agents, including the ones that they were concerned about, seem to be doing um, uh, as well as the general population, and their outcomes are more dependent on how old are they, what kind of general condition were they in. Uh, to add to the complexity, some of the hazard of, of COVID-19 is a hyperimmune response in the lungs, I'll call the cytokine storm, and one might imagine that the, to have some degree of immunosuppression, immunomodulation, could be at least hypothetically a protection against that storm. All I mean to say is there's a lots of hypotheses running around, lots of opinions running around, and we're still trying to look at the, the general experience to understand, yes, these are the hypotheticals, what's really happening? What's really happening so far is pretty reassuring. And, and the end of the story is not yet told. Peter, do you have other questions? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, can vitamin D be effective in treating the coronavirus? 
Dr. Hirsch, why don't you take that one? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And and I will have to admit that, you know, as we've been doing these programs, um, you know, we in the MS community have also been learning very rapidly. It's been a very steep learning curve um, in understanding uh, COVID-19 and what are potential treatments. And uh, vitamin D um, is actually a hot topic, um, not only for MS, but apparently for COVID-19 as well. Um, so we've known for a long time that um, it's important to avoid vitamin D deficiency uh, for bone health and cardiometabolic health and other purposes. But it may be even more important now than, than ever. Um, there's actually emerging and growing evidence that vitamin D status may be irrelevant um, to the risk of developing COVID-19 infection and to the severity of the disease um, overall. Um, we know that vitamin D has an immune modulating effect and can lower inflammation, and this is one of the reasons why we recommend vitamin D supplementation for long-term MS health. And this also may be relevant to the respiratory response during COVID-19 and the cytokine storm that Dr. Hendon had just alluded to. Um, there have actually been uh, a number of observational studies that have been coming out. One of them um, was from uh, South Asia um, that looked at the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency among patients who were affected by COVID-19. And it showed that the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was actually much higher among those with severe COVID illness compared to those with mild illness. Um, and they actually showed that there was about an eightfold higher risk of having a severe COVID-19 illness among those who entered with vitamin D deficiency compared with those who had sufficient vitamin D levels. Um, so, you know, in, in the MS community, uh, what we are, can, we, what we are um, uh, uh, defining a vitamin D sufficient is um, a, a level um, above uh, 30 nanograms per milliliter, but usually we are um, actually pushing the envelope forward and, um, you know, some folks are recommending vitamin D levels as high as 50 to 80. Um, and, and that's really for MS health. Um, but it, it certainly looks like um, a blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D less than 10 nanograms per milliliter may actually put an individual at an increased risk of having a worse off time of COVID-19 compared to someone who is um, more supplemented at a higher level. So we're learning along the way. It does look like vitamin D um, has a role, a protective role, um, against COVID-19. Thank you for Peter, that. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, guys. Peter, before, before, we, uh, before we go off, a couple comments. One is uh, we're, we're joined on the, on the line by one of our colleagues in the southeast, David Brandis, and I, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Hirsch and I would like to say hello to Dr. Brandis. Uh, number two, uh, a patient. Uh, uh, a person uh, in, the, in Arizona asked about um, uh, immunoglobulin, uh, uh, immunoglobulins on people on uh, Ocrevus and Rituxan. The answer is that, high, that, that low uh, IgG, low IgA, um, have been associated with an increased incidence, increased incidence of infection uh, in the pre-COVID era. We're not quite sure how that will relate uh, to uh, the COVID-19, but we're watching. Okay, great. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, and also, just as a quick follow-up to the vitamin D question was asked about uh, taking zinc, if that's recommended. You know, that's actually been a question that has come up in my clinic um, more than once. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, folks like to take um, um, uh, uh, zinc and vitamin C um, in order to try to thwart uh, uh, respiratory viral illnesses, especially during the winter months uh, during flu season. Um, I have not seen any data um, on zinc and zinc supplementation um, as it pertains to COVID-19. Um, I can certainly do my research, but um, I have not seen anything in, uh, in my lit searches uh, thus 
far. I'm not aware of any data. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, Dr. Hendon, have you read up on anything on zinc in COVID-19? No, same as you. Okay, in the interest of time, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to pose one more question, but also respectfully uh, would like Dr. Hennon and Dr. Hurst to respond back to any of the questions that they also saw come in or other general wrap-up questions as well. So the last question that I am asking is wondering about the, the differences, if there's any difference in the severity of COVID-19 based on how you may be exposed to it, whether someone coughs or sneezes directly in your face versus picking it up on a surface that you might have touched, and if there's any differences in, in how you were exposed to it to the severity that you are uh, contracted with it. I'm happy to try to answer that one, but it's going to be a common sense answer rather than a a scientific answer. So to the question uh, of do we have data uh, that has distinguished the severity of the, uh, of the exposure uh, to the severity of the uh, disease, the answer is that kind of information is really very limited. But common sense says, uh, with most other infectious illnesses, that a lesser exposure, both in terms of quantity uh, of virus and duration of exposure to that virus has generally been associated with a lesser uh, severity of disease. So common sense says, I think so. There's no science yet to back up my opinion. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so before I read our closing comments, I just wanted to ask Dr. Hennon and Dr. Hirsch if they had any general follow-up statements they would like to make. My only comment is how, how happy I've been, uh, Peter, to be able to work with MSAA in what I think is the, the, prime, the best patient um, platform for dealing with COVID-19, and that is where people with MS can listen to uh, thoughts about uh, uh, this pandemic. I also want to express my pleasure in being able to continue to work with Dr. Hirsch, uh, whose opinions I almost always share, uh, but it's a delight uh, just to work with her in any case. Uh, thanks. Yes, I'll, I'll echo my thanks to uh, Dr. Hendon um, and the MSAA. It's been a pleasure working with you all. And, and to our viewers, um, I, I, I'm certainly hopeful that you have found um, some useful information out of our webinars. I have been increasingly pleased and impressed by the, um, uh, the, the questions that have come through. They are very well thought out. They are um, certainly highly relevant. And um, I, I would uh, certainly encourage all of you to um, 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 uh, keep a lookout for future MSAA programs on COVID-19 and MS. And we will certainly be happy to provide information as we continue to learn in this very rapidly evolving landscape. And I thank you all for your patience and your time. Well, thank you both. Uh, I really appreciate that and all your time and expertise uh, being with us uh, in this series of programs to help provide information and timely updates uh, to keep everybody safe. Well, that does conclude tonight's webinar. Uh, as mentioned, I, I want to thank Dr. Barry Hendon and Dr. Carrie Hirsch for providing these incredibly helpful updates on this very important topic. I also want to thank our funding partners, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono, Genentech, Novartis, and Sanofi Genzyme for supporting this webinar series. As mentioned, tonight's webinar will be archived on MSAI's website very soon, and we ask you to take a very brief survey that is coming, next, coming up next. So on behalf of MSAA, Dr. Hendon and Dr. Hirsch, thank you again so much for watching and please stay safe.